About 300 million years ago, the sun rose on a humid tropical swamp in the north of England. A small, primitive reptile was bathing in the carboniferous sun to warm its blood for the day ahead when a giant, segmented monster crept up from behind and made a snack of it. The laws of nature impose tight limits on the maximum size that land invertebrates can attain. The anthropod body is completely encased in an exoskeleton. The legs are made up of jointed tubes that contain the muscles necessary for their movement. As the animal's size increases, the walls of these leg tubes rapidly increase in thickness, and operating the limbs soon would be impossible if the animal grew too large. Another constraint faced by large arthropods is breathing. Small forms such as insects can breathe through tubes, trachea, that open up on the outside of their body. The body then absorbs the oxygen into the hemolymphs, blood, through specialized soft membranes. The surface area of a body increases in proportion to the square of its dimensions, but the body's volume increases as the cube. Thus, if the size of an animal doubles, its body volume, which needs to be supplied by oxygen, increases eightfold. This geometric relationship significantly constrains size increase. And yet, an eight foot six creature called Arthropleura once crawled the Earth's equator in the Carboniferous period. But before we discuss how and why, we need to consider what the world of the Carboniferous was like. The beginning of the Carboniferous period generally had a more uniform tropical and humid climate than exists today. Seasons, if any, were not distinct. These observations are based on comparisons between fossils and modern-day plant morphology. The Carboniferous plants resemble those that live in tropical and mildly temperate areas today, and many of them lack growth rate which suggests the uniform climate. This uniformity in climate may have been the result of the large expanse of ocean that covered the entire surface of the globe, except for small sections. Shallow and warm marine waters often flooded the continents. Attached filter feeders such as rhizoans, particularly phanistellids, were abundant in this environment, and the seafloor was dominated by brachiopods. Trilobites were increasingly scarce, while foraminifers were abundant and the heavily armored fish from the Devonian became extinct, being replaced with more modern looking fish fauna. Today, insects and modern day millipedes take in oxygen through diffusion, and they take in this oxygen in proportion to their surface area. As we know, the surface area of a body increases in proportion to the square of its dimensions, but the body's volume increases by the cube. Whatever factor an insect grows by, its volume, and thus the volume of cells that require oxygen, increases by the cube. There's not enough surface area to accommodate enough trachea openings to allow for the required oxygen diffusion. However, during the Carboniferous, the rise of vast lowland swamp forests led to atmospheric oxygen levels of around 30%, close to 50% higher than current levels. This oxygen-rich environment allowed adult bugs to grow to ever larger sizes while still maintaining their energy needs. In fact, oxygen levels were so high that recent studies show so gigantism in their insects may have also happened as a defense mechanism to prevent oxygen poisoning in their larvae. Insect larvae typically absorb oxygen directly through their skin, so they have little or no control over exactly how much of the gas they take in. By contrast, adult insects can regulate their oxygen intake by opening or closing valve-like holes in their bodies called spiracles. This might have been the case for prehistoric insects as well. So, insect enlargement in the high oxygen atmosphere of the Carboniferous may have been encouraged in both stages of life to protect against oxygen poisoning from the high concentrations of oxygen in their larval forms and to take advantage of more efficient energy synthesis in their adult form. However, this is unlikely to have been the main factor for why Arthropleura grew so big. Because an Arthropleura fossil, recently discovered in Northumberland, UK, dates the species to 30 million years before the larger spike in oxygen. This means that Arthropleura evolved to this size before the proportionally larger amounts of oxygen. Scientists speculate that the later spike in partial pressure of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere only played a supporting role in the evolution of Arthropleura and that it was able to grow larger than modern-day anthropods 
gods because of the lack of large land predators at the time, similar to the process of island gigantism today. The fossil discovered in Northumberland, UK was by chance. A large sandstone block, approximately 2 by 3 by 8 meters, fell from the cliffs at Howick Bay. It cracked, exposing the fossil, and it was spotted by a former PhD student at the University of Cambridge who happened to be visiting the beach. Finding these giant millipede fossils is rare because once they die, their bodies tend to disarticulate come apart at the joints, so it's likely that the fossil is a molted carapace that the animal shed as it grew. What is now a cold, wet beach in the north of England was once a tropical river channel near the equator. Researchers believe the creature shed its exoskeleton into this river, then the exoskeleton filled with sand, leading it to its current preserved state, hundreds of millions of years later. The exoskeleton fragment is 2.5 feet long and 1.8 feet wide. This means that the individual that molted it would have been around 8.5 feet long and weighed around 110 pounds. This would have been the biggest animal on earth in the Carboniferous and the biggest land invertebrate in history. The Northumberland fossil also provided additional information on the sort of habitat that may have been preferred by the Arthroplora. Previously, Arthroplora was thought to have inhabited swampy environments. The Northumberland fossil was found in an ancient river channel, which was part of a delta. This was not a swampy habitat, but an area that was quite open with sparse woodland. As for what it ate, an earlier study reported possible gut contents in a specimen from Scotland. These contents were composed of debris from from the tree-like club mosses, lycophytes, that formed a major component of the swamp vegetation. Later re-studies of the fossil in question, however, indicate that it was an accidental association from skin fragments shed by Arthroplora with some plant fragments mixed in. When there's no coprolites, paleontologists look to an animal's mouth to work out what it ate. Sadly, the mouth parts have never been found in any fossils either. However, if it did have tough, strong jaws for biting big prey with, they would have been more likely to survive and become fossilized. So, while we can't know for sure what they ate, there were plenty of nutritious nuts and seeds available in the leaf litter at the time to feed a herbivorous lifestyle. Scientists speculate it may have even hunted small vertebrates, unlucky enough to cross its path on occasion. Arthroplora crawled around Earth's equatorial regions for around 45 million years before going extinct during the Permian period. Scientists aren't sure what caused their extinction, but it could have been due to the global warming that made their climates too dry for them to survive. At the beginning of the Permian, glaciation was widespread and latitudinal climatic belts were strongly developed. The climate warmed throughout the time period and, by the end of the Permian, Hot and dry conditions were so extensive that they caused a crisis in the marine and terrestrial life. This dramatic shift in the climate may have been partially triggered by the assembly of smaller continents into the supercontinent of Pangaea. At the same time, under the arid conditions during the Permian, amniotes, like the early reptiles, began to dominate terrestrial environments as they did not depend on permanent bodies of water to reproduce and skipped their larval stage. These reptiles competed for the same food and soon dominated the same habitats as Arthroplora. Another advantage that the reptiles would have had over an anthropod like Arthroplora is that anthropods have to deal with the fact that their shells are not flexible. This means to grow to bigger sizes, they must frequently shed their protective exoskeleton and survive with a softer skin barrier until their new exoskeleton hardens. This would have made Arthroplora an easy prey for the evolving tetrapods over its lifetime. The work done by researchers indicates that Arthroplora may be most closely related to present-day Penicillata, a group including the tiny bristle millipede Polyxenus, which are widespread in the drier habitats in eastern North America. The types of dry habitats that would have pushed Arthroplora to extinction. 